In the shadow of COVID-19, I want to talk about how some simple mathematical models can be used to help understand the spread of infectious diseases. So during December of 2019, we all know that a new disease emerged in Wuhan, China. Its cause was eventually determined to be a new beta coronavirus. And this virus was named SARS-CoV-2 for its similarity to the SARS-CoV virus, which was responsible for the 2002-2003 SARS epidemic. This new disease that it caused was, na was named COVID-19 for the coronavirus disease 2019. An epidemiologist quickly set out to determine how quickly and how widely this new disease might spread. One of the methods that they turned to were something called compartmental models. Now, these models have been in development since the opening decade of the 20th century. And some of the earliest work was done by a physician named Ronald Ross and a mathematician named Hilda Hudson. And together they were interested in understanding the transmission of malaria. Then a few years later, biochemist William Kermack and a physician named Anderson McKendrick built upon those models to derive a set of equations whose form closely resembles the ones that I will demonstrate today. Now, compartmental models are used in a variety of fields from physics to chemistry, biology, economics, and epidemiology. The idea is to understand how things flow from one compartment or state to another. And what makes these types of models so powerful is that they allow us to simulate an outbreak and in doing so we can discover important insights that can help us to combat the epidemic. So here's a textbook SIR model. It represents a population of people who flow from one disease state to the next. And it's generally assumed that everyone's going to start in a susceptible compartment. Everybody except one patient, patient zero, and that patient starts in the infectious box. Patient zero is the person who introduces a new disease into the population. And as patient zero contacts susceptible individuals, they themselves might become sick and then join patient zero in the infectious box. And so they either recover or, and require immunity or they die. So in either case, they become removed from the infectious state and they're no longer susceptible either. So this follows the classic immune response where a person's immune system fights off an initial infection and in doing so develops antibiotics for that infection that allow it to fight off future exposures without getting sick again. So over any given time interval, a certain percentage of individuals are going to move from one state to the next. And the rate at which individuals move from the susceptible state to the infectious state is equal to the number of all possible encounters, which we calculate from S times I, the number of individuals that are susceptible, times the number of individuals that are infectious, and then multiply that by the proportion of those encounters that are actually going to result in an, in an infection. So that proportion we'll call beta. Uh, then the transition rate out of the infectious box is just the number of infectious individuals, or I, multiplied by a proportion that recover during that time interval, which we represent as gamma. So with those transition rates in mind, we can mathematically define an epidemic. Anytime you have people being infected faster than they are recovering, you have an epidemic. But anytime people recover faster than they are infected, the epidemic sort of burns itself out. In other words, if the rate going in divided by the rate going out of the infected box is greater than one, there's an epidemic. But if that ratio is less than one, the epidemic will burn out. And this ratio tells us exactly what we need to do to stop an epidemic in its tracks or to even prevent one from occurring in the first place. So we can lower beta, that proportion of all possible encounters that result in a transmission, we can slow the epidemic. How would we do this? Beta can be described as the product of two other proportions, the proportion of all possible contacts that actually occur and the probability that any one contact results in transmission. So quarantine would lower the number of actual interactions that take place and then prophylactic measures such as hand washing, disinfectants, face masks, and things like that could lower the chances that any encounter actually results in a transmission. All right, gamma then is, is, gamma is really just the inverse of the duration of the infection. So doing things like seeking immediate medical treatment, it might be possible to shorten the length of an infection and thereby helping to move more quickly from that infectious state to the removed state and more quickly end an epidemic. The last variable in the ratio is S. And we'll, as we'll shortly see, S decreases with time as people move out of the S box and into the infected box. If a vaccine is available, individuals can bypass the infectious state and move immediately into the removed box. So our ratio then is not constant. And eventually the ratio always drops below one as the epidemic burns out. But what if we could skip the infectious box altogether and move people from the S box directly into the R box with a vaccine? 
the ratio could shrink dramatically with zero infections and we could start out in a much better place. This is exactly what vaccinations do. And in fact, if enough people are vaccinated that the starting point starts out below zero, then we have what we call herd immunity and an outbreak can't ever even begin. To actually build the model of an outbreak, we need to estimate the initial values for beta, gamma, and S. And then we set up a set of, a set of differential equations that mimic the flow of individuals from one compartment to the next. We estimate gamma and beta from prior knowledge. So gamma is, like I said earlier, just the inverse of the duration of the infection. And that's pretty easy to measure at the beginning stages of a disease outbreak. So beta then is calculated from something called the basic reproductive rate of the disease. It's, you'll also hear this, uh, the basic reproductive rate called the R naught or R zero, R sub zero, depending on who you talk to. And what that is is simply the average number of new cases that will be caused by patient zero over the course of their infection. And it's really just the starting value for that ratio that we were talking about earlier, because at the start, pretty much everybody is susceptible. And then the, differenti the differential equations that I'll use are slightly out of scope for this, uh, for this talk, but if you look in the script over here on the right, the example script, you can kind of pick those out. Okay, let's take a look at how these things work. This is a Shiny app that I wrote in RStudio and Shiny. Uh, we'd have a hypothetical population of 100,000 individuals, and we're looking at a disease with a reproductive number, an R0 of 2.4, and a duration of infection of seven days. And let's start our population with zero people immune, and let's simulate over uh, 180 days. As we can see on here, it looks like nearly everybody, except for our one infectious individual at start, is susceptible. And over the first, I don't know, 40 days or so, 30 to 40 days, very little appears to be happening, but a low, no, a low number of people, a small number of people are transmitting the disease. And then right around day, you know, this looks like around day 30, 35 or so, things really start ramping up and you get this exponential growth and you get a huge jump here around day 60 or so of infected individuals. We, we reach our peak here of the maximum number of people. And at this point, the infection rate then starts to drop. Our number of inf susceptible individuals has dropped way, way down and our number of recovered individuals is going way, way up until around day 100 or so when the infection has burned out and we've reached an equilibrium. Now what happens if we drop this reproductive number? If we have a disease that doesn't reproduce quite as quickly, remember the reproductive number is the number of individuals that patient zero was going to infect. If we have a smaller reproductive number, watch how these curves, sort of that, that red infected curve flattens out and the overall equilibrium here that we get at the end, the asymptotes that we reach, fewer people end up ever getting infected a certain number of them are, remain, remain susceptible. They never acquire the disease. Um, and, a, and a fewer number of people end up being recovered. Now what happens if we change the duration of the infection? If it's a shorter duration, the infection goes much more quickly. Notice we're not changing where this equilibrium happens. This, the, the infection just burns itself out much more quickly. And if it, it's a longer infection, the, the epidemic can last a little bit longer. All right, so let's drop these back down to seven. And what happens if we have a proportion of the population that's initially immune? Well, as we can see, our equilibrium starts to change at the end. More and more people start out in that recovered or that removed stage because these are the, these are the people, of course, that are, that are immune readily. And if we can bump this up high enough, we can see that we barely get any infection happening at all, which is really nice. This is how herd immunity happens. So there we go. Even that simple model can help public health and medical communities anticipate how an infection might progress through a population. And while not all diseases progress so simply from S to I to R directly, that modeling approach is flexible enough to handle a variety of different disease progression. For example, this model allows us to track births and deaths. Tracking mortality is important for deadly diseases, and then births become important if a disease is expected to persist in a population over a long period of time. Some infections can become chronic, like HPV, so once acquired, the patient will remain infectious for life. 
Another thing that can happen in certain cases is that uh, a person recovers, but then doesn't become fully immune and can simply move back into the susceptible box. They never actually become removed. And then there's a whole family of vector-borne disease models. Um, malaria is a, such a disease where a pathogen gets passed among hosts of completely different species. And here a person has to come in contact with an infected vector in order to get the disease. And then likewise, the vector has to come in contact with an infectious host or an, inf an infectious uh, person uh, in order to become infectious themselves. So you get this disease passing between one species to another. Now often there'll be an, a fourth box in an SIR model, and this is an SEIR model. Um, this is for people who have been exposed to an infection but are still incubating and not infectious themselves. So some of the COVID models that I saw took this approach to accommodate the incubation period. So compartmental models are by design simplifications of complex systems, and they help us to understand the fundamental dynamics of disease spread. But I sort of hate to put up a specific curve here because there were so many different factors at play in COVID, and so many of its characteristics varied from place to place and, and through time. So uh, there's a whole nother type of model called an individual-based model, and those are, those are sort of better for prediction accuracy because they can handle sort of those emergent properties that happen uh, unexpectedly. Uh, the Imperial College London model that was so widely um, talked about was one such model. But nevertheless, SIR models are good for understanding the overall dynamics of an epidemic. So I hope you can take away four key points from my talk today. First is that an epidemic occurs when susceptible individuals are becoming sick faster than infected individuals are recovering. Second, in an SIR framework, an outbreak always ends before everyone gets sick. And third, that property of SIR models means that an, an effective public health and medical interventions can, can potentially slow the progress of an epidemic. They can reduce the percentage of a population that gets sick. Uh, and potentially, um, if a high enough people can become vaccinated, you can prevent an outbreak from occurring in the first place. So lastly, that compartmental framework can be applied to a variety of patterns of disease progression. And finally, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I describe myself as a quantitative ecologist turned data scientist, and I've been with RGA since 2017. Prior to that, I led the development of a data science degree program for St. Louis University's Center for Health Outcomes Research. And if you found this topic interesting, please find me on LinkedIn or contact me at eric.westis at rgare.com. Thank you very much.